Hello, beautiful people, and welcome, hi, to a Genshin Impact 3.4 meta roundup. Now, what the f*** does that mean? Basically, we're gonna go through all of the archetypes that we have, how well they perform this abyss, the kind of stuff that they need to be better if they perform poorly, or the kind of stuff that could prevent them from working well if they perform well. Basically, just so that you get a decent idea for what's strong and what's weak, because at the end of the day, there's always gonna be a very skewed perception of what is strong and what's weak, because there's things that are strong, but more difficult to play. There's things that are strong, but only if you're a dolphin or a whale and you invest all of your resources into it. There's things that are strong, but that don't have the opportunity to invest into them that much because some character's best weapon is a four-star weapon over the five-star options. All in all, right, there's a lot of factors that go into what makes things strong or weak. And depending on where you get your information, you might only hear about hyper carry teams because, well, the people you want Watch are people who hyper invest into a hyper carry or you might not hear about them at all and i figured that having a video that just gives people a decent idea for what, like all of the things that are strong and like what can make them weaker like their their upsides or downsides would probably be a nice resource to have so i figured you know why not so we'll start with the ones that people mostly already know or already understand and then we'll move into the stuff that's a little bit more dank all right so we'll start with these teams because people generally have a pretty decent idea for what they are and how they work and I think the one I want to start with is Mono Geo. I very often talk about how Geo is generally the worst element. The fact that its reactions are very bad means that generally you want to play Geo units with other Geo units to form Mono Geo teams rather than trying to play around reactions. That doesn't mean that Mono Geo teams are bad though. Mono Geo teams are effectively kind of another way to play the game if you don't like reactions. You can think of Geo as kind of a physical number two. So the main advantages that Mono Geo has or have is basically mono geo teams are generally a lot easier to play they're very very straightforward in what they're trying to do you're generally playing three or four geo units and just casting your stuff and you don't care about your reactions all you need to worry about is your energy management and that's kind of it also generally you really do want to use Lee in those teams uh, which means that they're very tanky so they have a certain ease of play and they're very tanky which makes them a very very appealing option for more casual players who don't mind actually having to go for all the pieces to make it work. Now, its biggest downside is that you do need a lot of pieces to make it work because at a baseline, the Geo units, like I said, work well with each other and not that well with non-Geo units, which means that if you want to play a Mono Geo team, you're generally going to need to have a few of the good Geo units. Mono Geo is a team that scales pretty well with either dolphin level investment or vertical investment, like saving up a bunch to spend all of your primo gems on a specific banner. And all in all, it is actually pretty strong. In this current abyss, Mono Geo has some good, some bad. So against Simon, generally you're gonna wanna not go four Geo, but rather go three Geo plus an Electro to get this guy to not stay invisible for most of the fight, which obviously limits the, the options that you can potentially go for. Uh, you don't have to, like you can still just go Mono Geo, but it makes it generally a lot slower on that chamber, but it's definitely something you can do. Against the second side though, Mono Geo can actually be pretty good. The biggest downside that Mono Geo teams have is that, well, generally Mono Geo consists of either Ito or Noel as your carry, then Goro, then Albedo, and then Strongly, right? That's like the, the general core of the team. But the triple Genki, you can't place Albedo's flower under them, which means that you're gonna have to make sure that you aim it well. And then on top of that, a lot of their attacks damage the flower so it can very easily remove it. And also the like cryo field slows down your attack speed, which actually matters a lot for a character like Ito that's gonna feel a lot more clunky when you're applied with cryo, which you don't have a choice in a team like this, unless you replace one of your options for something like Bennett to self-apply pyro to make sure that you don't keep that cryo on you. Uh, other than that though, Mono Geo teams are not that bad at dealing with elemental shields. Obviously they're not great, but at least Crystallize works on every single type of elemental shield, which means that you're kind of meh at breaking elemental shields, but you're kind of meh against each type of shield. And because this chamber is generally not all that difficult, if you have a way to like keep hitting all of the enemies at, at the same time, which Mono Geo teams do, then it's not much of a problem. And then in Chamber 3, Mono Geo has some advantages because it's generally, like I said, some tankier teams, which means that dealing with enemies that really, really try very hard to kill you a lot uh, is a little bit easier. So Mo Mono Geo, this abyss, pretty solid side too. 
not the greatest side one, uh, but it can still be made to work with uh, by swapping uh, an electro unit in. Mono Geo kind of does work a lot like hyper carry teams, except you just don't use the same units as the other hyper carry teams, which is kind of nice because it lets you have a lot of the good units still available for your second side. But let's let's talk about hyper hyper carries next. Now hyper carries is very vague, right? There's a lot of different units that can be played as hyper carries, and even the units that are not really designed to be hyper carries, you can still put them in a team that kind of treats them like a hyper carry. The basic idea behind any sort of hyper carry team is that you have one unit that's doing most of your damage and the rest of your team's main role is to increase their damage and you're willing to sacrifice personal damage on your supports for better buffs on your carry. So generally when you look at hyper carry teams, the most popular ones will be Xiao, Raiden. You can kind of consider Ito to be a pseudo hyper carry team, right? In, in Mono Geo. Uh, you'll have a Wanderer. Sino's one of those units that isn't really meant to be that much of a hyper carry. Like he spends a lot of time on field, but he has good synergy with supports that have a lot of personal damage. So you generally don't play him as a hyper carry that much. Ella is a good example. I generally don't include Hu Tao and Yoimiya and Deluke in the hyper carry category because Sing is just too good. So he does a pretty solid amount of personal damage. And because it's a reaction team, then it, it is also more specific than just hyper carry. But yeah, I don't like hyper carry teams at all. The main reason why I don't like hyper carry teams is because at equal investment, they're generally heavily outshined by other teams. The thing though with hyper carries is that A, you get to spend more time on your favorite unit if your favorite unit is the hyper carry you're using. B, it generally scales better with hyper investment. If, for example, one unit is doing all of your team's DPS, then getting their five-star signature weapon, let's say it's a 25% increase, will be a 25% increase to your whole team DPS. If a unit is only 40%, then instead of being 25% of 100, it's gonna be 25% of 40, which is a 10% team DPS increase. Which means that generally, hyper carry teams tend to scale a bit better with uh, whaling or just saving up your primo gems to go for those teams. Because that's generally not where I focus most of my theory crafting, I don't care about it that much, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. And if you're a player who does spend a bit of money or who doesn't really enjoy trying a bunch of different teams and really wants to get like one really, really strong team, then hyper carry stuff can be uh, quite a bit better. There is definitely a pretty big difference in strength between the hyper carries with Raiden actually being a pretty competitive option to other teams, but the other hyper carries generally falling flat. They obviously generally have still like some advantages. You look at Wanderer, for example, when you play him as a hyper carry, he is most of your team's damage and he can hit enemies basically no matter where they are at least if you're in single target, right? Flying bosses, shit like that, Wolf Lord. Wanderer doesn't mind that at all. So all in all, generally those hyper carries have like one thing. And when you look at non hyper carry teams, if one of your characters can hit enemies no matter where they are, but the other ones can't, you're losing most of your team's DPS. In hyper carry teams, if you look at a flying enemy with Wanderer, you still have basically all of your DPS. If you look at a very large group of enemies with Xiao, you still have Xiao doing his damage to all of the enemies. All in all, hyper carry teams can be pretty strong, especially if you hyper invest into them. This a bit specifically, I'd say that the right and hyper carry teams do quite well. You can play right and hyper carry second side without much of a problem, uh, but you can also play it first side if you can get through the, the first chamber that has like the electro node thing that buffs the enemies. Uh, it, is, it has electro obviously because it's Raiden, so Simon won't be too difficult. Uh, and it basically does well on both sides. Xiao, I would say on the first side, doesn't do too great. All right, Xiao in single target is fine, but when you're against Simon, on top of that, you need you kind of need an electro. This chamber is not too difficult for him. This one can be a bit of a pain. Xiao's not that great on the first side of this abyss, but he is actually very good on the second side. Actually, all three chambers are the kind of situation that Xiao's looking for, which is a bunch of enemies that stay close enough together for his AoE to hit them. A lot of teams can struggle with keeping the Kenkis grouped close enough together to hit all of them, but Chao's AoE is on the larger side when it when you look at AoE teams. He can also dodge a lot of the cryo damage over time just by jumping, because he jumps to plunge, which means that you don't need quite as much 
healing or shielding against the Kenkis. Wanderer, I would say this abyss is okay. Second side is gonna be a little bit rough for him because of the AoE, but first side is a little bit more easy. Uh, you can slot in an Electro unit to deal with Simon. And then I guess I should talk about Ella. Uh, this is not the greatest abyss for her. First side, she's against enemies with pretty high physical resistance, which isn't the end of the world because you are getting a lot of shred. But obviously, you're not doing as much damage against enemies that have higher res than enemies that have lower res. So even if she can remove most of that resistance against other enemies, she could make that resistance go into the negatives and increase her damage more, right? So enemies with high physical resistance, generally not that ideal. And the fact that they come in four different ways make it pretty difficult for her to like get all the value out of her burst. Very possible that, um, that you way overkill one of the enemies because... You can't quite kill it before your burst falls, so your burst ends up way overkilling, so then optimally you swap out early, which is like not ideal. Anyways, this abyss is not the greatest for her in terms of like the first sight here, although this is not the, like chamber one is not the hardest out of the chambers. Because she has a pretty high amount of resistance to interruption, if you have enough shielding or healing, this chamber is not too big of a problem. And then this chamber is actually kind of difficult most of the time because the way that Simon's attacks work and how he kind of randomizes the exact moment where he goes invisible means that unless you plan your stuff very, very well, it's very, very possible that he goes invisible before your burst drops. So all in all, not the greatest. Uh, second side is AoE, which is generally not the like most optimal kind of content for Ella. Although it is AoE against humanoid enemies here and humanoid enemies have negative physical resistance. They are generally at minus 20. The Genkis will generally be somewhat close enough together that at least your burst will be able to hit all three of them, but most of your normal attacks won't. So a decent portion of your damage unfortunately won't. Now, obviously, Ella's burst damage depends on how many times she attacked, and Cryo Aura slows down your attack speed, which is a false. additional pain in the ass against these guys. And this chamber is not too difficult, as long as uh, the Whopper Flowers decide to behave. All in all, if you use her second side, I'd say this is slightly above average kind of content for Ella Hyper teams. Uh, you can play Hyper Carry Ayato, but Ayato is one of those units that, like, he's not really meant to be played as a Hyper Carry, and while you can use him as a Hyper, it won't perform as well as if you didn't. Although, his constellations are centered on his personal damage most of the time, and then his weapon also is. So, like, if you do really like Ayato and you wail on him, sure, you can play Hyper Ayato. Next up, we can talk about the other Mono teams. Let's start with Mono Hydro. Mono Hydro is good. The biggest problem that Mono Hydro has is that most of the time, you would be able to improve your team by replacing Placing one of your Hydro units with just a non-Hydro unit because Hydro's reactions are so good. That being said, because the Hydro units are very strong and have very good personal damage, Mono Hydro is still a very, very solid team. Now, generally what people do with Mono Hydro is they go a Hydro Onfielder, Kazuha, and then Sing Yelan, which means that it's a team that's mostly focused on single target damage, which makes it pretty strong on the first side of this abyss. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't have Electro, so with this, eh, not ideal. And so I would recommend if you have a Mono Hydro team built up, just replace either your Kazuha or one of your Hydro units with Fischl to make this a lot less of a pain in the ass for this specific abyss. The second side is more AoE focused, but generally because you're playing Sing and Yelan, you have enough damage to brute force it anyways. Um, uh, and it's fine. Mono Cryo. Why play Mono Cryo when Freeze exists is basically the biggest downside to Mono Cryo. You can, and it has the advantage of being better against enemies that are not freezable, which is generally most bosses. All in all, Mono Cryo this abyss is actually okay. Hoyo has really done its best to make Freeze feel like shit as much as possible for, for a while. And so as such, right, in this abyss, freezable pog. Freezable pog, although these guys have freeze resistance, but they don't have freeze immunity, so it's fine. Oh, oh yeah, freeze against this, just not good. Wow, freezable pog. Oh, freezable pog. On both sides, there's one chamber that's gonna make you hate your life if you play Freeze. With the Kenki chamber, if you are playing Ayaka and you have a hyper-invested Ayaka, obviously you'll be fine anyways, but you do need to have a hyper-invested Ayaka. When I was playing Ayaka on my Taiwan account, I needed like three, a little bit more than three. It was like three and a half Ayaka bursts to kill them because I couldn't Freeze and I don't have Kazuha and I don't have Mona, which means that in order to even be able to clear in 90 seconds, that's like four and a half 20 second rotations. Realistically, you're not playing perfectly, so it's probably more like four. 
So I need to kill them in four bursts, which is kind of what I need, which means that my burst would need to hit all of them on each burst, which is Bolt. impossible. <laughs> if you need two bursts to kill them, if you need two and a half, it's very doable. But keeping the enemies grouped for more than like 25 seconds for the Kenkis just won't happen. And so at my level of inve inv investment, I basically needed to have an incredibly fast first side to be able to do it. It didn't feel good. Generally, Frieza Abyss is not what I'd recommend. But Ayaka is one of those units that scales pretty well with vertical investment. So if you have vertical investment on her, if you have like C2, C3, C4, or if you have Misplit or whatever, if you have Shenha, if you have Kazuha, units that work well with her, you'll be able to brute force your way through it anyways. When it comes to Freeze in general, just this Abyss ain't it. And they really have been doing their best to make it feel as shit as possible. Uh, freeze is still good. And if you're struggling not to die on this, on this chamber, I can very like safely recommend just getting through the Abyss, getting your three stars with another team on this and then going again getting your freeze team through this which is going to take probably a lot longer but whatever and then using the your freeze team here to get your three stars uh, because freeze always has that advantage of being so incredibly safe and comfortable against freezable enemies and because this is a chamber that's pretty aggressive you can feel free to do that you can also do the exact same thing for the consecrated beasts they do have freeze resistance freeze doesn't last as long on the consecrated beasts as it does against other enemies but even with that freeze does still make chambers like that a lot easier to complete without dying. Monopyro. Monopyro is good. The biggest obstacle to Monopyro is abysses where you need to break pyro shields. In this abyss, with Kazuha's E and Burst, you can swirl off the Electro and Cryo Abyss made shield, but because of the way that the, the elemental shields work, Pyro on Cryo is like two times. Like when you swirl all three together, your Pyro Swirl is gonna Bolt. demolish this. And Cryo on Pyro is 0.5 times. And so it's not gonna do that much, which means that if you use your animal ability against all three of its mages, the Cryo Abyss Mage and the Electro Abyss Mage will lose their shield before the Pyro Abyss Mage does. Which means that you'll be left with a Pyro Abyss Mage that has a shield and the other two shields will be gone. So you can't use Animo to swirl onto them anymore. You can just use Swirl like the animal application to slowly whittle down the pyro shield so it's still very doable it's not that big of a problem because it's not that tanky of a shield but it is a little bit of an annoyance uh, all in all though uh, mono pyro does very very well on the second side because well it's pretty easy to deal with all the enemies uh especially when most of your damage comes from kazuha and Changling, which are or at least a good portion of your damage comes from kazuha and Changling, which have pretty large aoe specifically against the magu kenki you are going to have to be careful because when you're standing in bennett burst the cryo kenki's like downwards attack can very very easily one shot you so just make sure you iframe that either with a dash or if you want to play it safe just with a burst or you can also hold your kazuha e and that makes you jump high enough that uh, it won't hit you. If you tap your Kazuha E, you will not be high enough and it will still hit you and it will kill you. On the on the first chamber, obviously, you can just replace one of your units with an Electro to deal with this. Otherwise, it's going to be probably pretty slow. So generally, it's more of a second chamber thing, this or this. I guess next up, we can talk about National. For the ones who are not aware of the, of the names, because we're starting to get into teams that have names that are not just the reaction or the name of the element, I'll, ex I'll explain them really quick. So National is basically any team that revolves around Tangling Vape. That's what National is. It's just vaping Tangling. The reason why I separate National from most of the other vape teams is because basically every other vape team relies on an on-field vape carry, but Tangling's burst, snapshots, and stays even when you swap out, meaning that you have a lot more versatility with the hydro units you can use because you don't need to have off-field hydro application for your on-field pyro, you can do the other way around. On-field hydro application for your off-field pyro. The baseline national team does use off-field hydro just because there's no good four-star on-field hydro. This is like the most basic version of it and it's basically never bad. <laughs> and this abyss, it's very strong against the second side, against the triple Kenki. I generally recommend driving on sucrose, so while your sounding burst is going, normal attacking on sucrose. That way you swirl hydro onto the other Kenkis and so you vape on all three of them instead of only one. You can play it against Simon, generally because Shangling Vape teams have just very 
solid damage. Uh, you might be able to get through it even without having to replace any units. If you don't quite have that level of investment, uh, you can replace Seagrass with Fischl just to get that Electro application. It kind of becomes an Overvape team, which is Overload and Vape, but still kind of a National team. Uh, obviously, you can do Raiden National. I'd say that Raiden National in this Abyss is pretty solid. You have the Electro that can deal with a second side Simon. You have the kind of enemies that don't get knocked back too much. The enemies that get knocked back the most are in this chamber, right? So the, the Walbert Flowers get knocked back a lot, and the Abyss Mages, once you break their shields, get knocked back a lot, but they're very, very squishy, so it's not the end of the world. Uh, the Clearwater and Sunfrost, once they start infusing, don't really get knocked back anymore. So they're not going to be that big of a problem. Here, nothing really gets knocked back other than like the Kairagis and the Nobushis. We get knocked back a little bit, but not too much. So it's very easy to deal with. And here, the first wave has the Day Thunder, Sunfrost, and Clearwater, which can get knocked back a little bit. But the second wave is enemies that don't actually get knocked back because they spawn they spawn their Az and they're invulnerable to knock back while their Az are out on the field. Which means that all in all, while it is generally better on the first side because it's a team that's a bit better in, in single target than AoE, uh, it still very much is fine on the second side. Well, let's talk about the other versions of National. So you can also use National with like Ayato or Child as your Hydro. Technically, you can kind of do it with Kokomi, but it's generally not something I'd recommend because the Hydro application is kind of shit in AoE. Uh, if you do use an Ayato with Sucrose generally, or a Child with Kazuha, or a Child with Sucrose, generally I don't like Ayato with Kazuha, but it can still work fine. Generally though, that's the more going to be second side because you're playing a team that's a lot more focused on AoE damage. You have AoE Hydro application and AoE like Vaves from Sailing, but you can also just play the over Vape versions with Fischl if you want to go on the first side. Next up is the on-field Vape carries. So here I'm talking about Huta, I'm talking about Yuimiya, the Luke, I guess Yanfei if you're really pushing it. Now obviously some of them are better than others. In general I would say that Hutao is very very strong on the first side of the Abyss. Uh, she's one of the units that can without too much of a problem brute force their way through Simon even if you don't have Electro. Uh, however you can also just very easily slot an Electro unit into your Hutao team. You can play Hutao, Fischl, Singto plus whatever last unit you want because your teams have a decent amount of flexibility outside of just making sure that you have that Singto or C2 plus Yelan. Uh, second side, not quite as good because it's a lot more AoE focused, can still kind of function, but it's generally more of a first side thing this Abyss. And then when you start looking at the other Pyros, you can kind of get the same, it's really the same thing, but just worse. Uh, this Abyss doesn't have any like, real flying enemies that are difficult for Hu Tao to like, keep attacking, which means that Yoimiya doesn't have that advantage that she can sometimes have over Hu Tao. Uh, so she's only left with basically all of the disadvantages that she has versus Hu Tao, which is just lower output overall. A lot more single target focus, meaning that this becomes a bit, like Chamber 2 becomes a bit more difficult, but she's still functional, right? You can still very much play her. And then you've got someone like Duluku Yanfei, who's kind of, again, the same thing, but even more rough. Next up, I guess we can talk about Taser. Taser's actually very good this this. So Taser is generally Electro, Hydro, and Animo. Because you have Hydro, you're generally interested in using the units that are very good single target Hydro, like Sinso or Yelan. And in terms of Electro, very often you'll find yourself using Fischl. So two units that have pretty solid single target damage, including one of one who does Electro damage, right? Meaning that first side is generally pretty much a breeze, uh, as long as you don't die, obviously. A lot of Taser teams don't run that many defensive options, so if that's something you struggle with, don't try to force it too hard. But otherwise, very, very easy to get through this abyss. But also, because Taser relies on animal units, generally Sucrose to drive, but you can also use Ayato as your driver, and then Kazuha, or still just Sucrose, but drive on someone else. And they have grouping, and they have pretty solid AoE damage, making them just a very solid option for uh, for a second half as well. You can do right in Taser, yeah. Very, that's very, very doable. But yeah, all in all, pretty solid Abyss for Taser, right? This is an Abyss that kind of likes Electro, meaning that all teams that have Electro in it have a slight edge at a baseline. Uh, but also, Taser just doesn't really have bad matchups generally. So, all in all, pretty solid. Next up, Aggravate. So aggravate teams are generally somewhat similar to taser teams with the main difference that your hydro units become dendro. I'd say that aggravate this abyss is a little bit more difficult because when it comes to hydro, right, you have Singto most of the time uh, that you can use in a hydro in a in a taser team that gives you a lot of damage reduction. And because both uh, the Kenkis and the Consecrated Beasts are actually very good at one-shotting the fuck out of you, having that damage resistance is actually gonna be the difference between getting one shot and not being able to do anything if you get hit like 
at the wrong moment, or surviving and then being able to heal it back up. Because Dendro doesn't have shielders or units that give a lot of damage resistance, and because Electro doesn't have real shielders, you do have like Beto's C1 shield. And Beto can also give you some da uh, damage resistance, but it's not nearly as much as Sing So. So generally, you're a lot squishier in the aggravate teams, which is why a lot of people this abyss have opted to use Zhongli in their aggravate teams rather than the animal unit that generally are better, which means that your overall damage goes down. However, the blessing is really, really good for aggravate teams, which means that having to sacrifice a little bit of your offensive utility to get a stronger shield if you don't think you can get through the chamber two without dying, because you're getting so much from the blessing, it's really not that big of a deal, which means that aggravate teams are still very, very strong this of this. Main thing you're looking for when it comes to aggravate, you're, you're good against single target because you're generally using Feshul, and you're good against AoE because you're generally also using another unit that has good AoE, something like Kutsing, something like Kazuha, or Sucrose, actually has pretty good AoE damage. The main thing is, very often it can be difficult to slot in shielders. Now with the release of Yao Yao, healers are very easy to slot in, but shielders are still something that you have to sacrifice a lot for it, right? You generally have to sacrifice your animal unit, or your second Electro unit, which are a massive pain in the ass, and it's not something you want to be doing. This Abyss, it doesn't matter that much because the Blessing is really good, but in general, that's something to keep an eye out for. Spread teams, are kind of similar in that sense, with the main difference being that teams that focus more on the spread side of Quicken than on the aggravate side of Quicken, they're doing less electro damage and more dendro damage, which means that you're not as, I don't want to say reliant, but you don't care as much about getting an animal unit to swirl that electro to get that VV plus whatever buffs you can get. Meaning that it doesn't hurt as much to have to use a unit like Zhongli to make it through if you struggle with not dying. All in all though, spread and aggravate are very, very strong this abyss. I'd say that their biggest down side is that very very often you can change one of your units around add a bunch of reactions in that way and get a stronger team but before we do we can talk about nilo which is the last one of the teams that are actually very very straightforward nilo is very good this abyss now obviously don't play her on side one you actually will not get through <laughs> unless you're welled out the wazoo you will not get through <laughs> <laughs> but on, on the second side, uh, Nilo Bloom is actually very good. These enemies kind of group themselves up very easily on all three of the waves. The Cryo Shield is generally your biggest obstacle this abyss. But in case you didn't know, Elemental Shields can still take just damage, like just normal, like straight up damage, which is five times the HP of the mob. But because Abyss Mages are very, very squishy, you can brute force your way through a Cryo Shield just with Bloom damage, which means that even if you don't have a way to specifically react off the cryo because freeze doesn't remove the cryo shield and dendro plus cryo doesn't have a reaction uh, with your nilo team you can still get through it through brute forcing the shield because it's such a small hp pool uh but yeah so nilo teams apart from getting through that cryo shield which isn't that big of a deal actually are very very good this abyss right first wave three enemies that burrow and then come back up where you go three enemies that teleport where you go and four enemies that aggressively walk towards you or run towards you. All right, so it's enemies that group themselves in a lot of them, which makes Neo teams very, very good. Kenki, three enemies that stay actually close enough together for most of Nilo's AoE damage to actually hit all of them. And the first wave here, three enemies that groove themselves because they aggressively run towards you. And then three enemies that spawn more enemies for you to, you, to, to trigger Bloom and get even more Bloom seeds. So all in all, this abyss feels like it was tailor-made for Nilo. Uh, it's very, very good for her. Nilo teams in general, they can struggle a little bit when you don't have a lot of the pieces that make them work. A, a bit like Mono Geo, actually. With the main difference being that generally those pieces that make the Nilo teams work can also actually be pretty good in other non-Nilo teams. So they're a little bit more valuable by themselves. So generally you're looking at Nahida, uh, sometimes Kokomi, although with the release of Yao Yao, we now have other options outside of Kokomi. Nilo teams also scale very, very well with vertical investment, uh, with the key, with Nilo C2, with Nahida C2. This abyss specifically, even if you play a free-to-play Nilo team, no Nahida, you'll be fine because this is a very good abyss for Nilo teams. In general though, uh, when you don't have Nahida, Nilo teams can actually fall a lot further behind when one of the chambers has single target 
or one of the chambers has enemies that don't that you kind of want an animal grouper against because they spawn too far away from each other and don't run towards you. Against those kind of chambers, Nilo teams can very much struggle if you don't have all the pieces, but with all the pieces, you can very easily brute force your way through it uh, because they become very, very strong. Nilo teams out of the way though, there are other teams that people tend to forget about somewhat that are good in the same kind of situations as Nilo teams, and those are Burgeon teams. Burgeon teams are actually very, very, very good this abyss. Unlike the Nilo teams, Burgeon teams use a pyro unit, which means that the cryo abyss thing isn't even a consideration anymore. Now, the main issue that Burgeon generally has is that when you trigger burning on enemies, you have two units of burning, and then a hydro application onto that will not bloom. It will only vaporize, and you won't get a seed out of it, which means that you need very, very fast hydro in order to keep getting seeds. You can showcase that very, very easily by going to any enemy, really, getting Yelan in your party, along with Nahida and Sangli, and using all of your stuff and seeing how many blooms you get, or how many burgeons you get. All right, so we get one at the beginning. Oh, we get another two here. Three, Paul. When we use our E, but we didn't actually get any burgeons when we weren't using Yelan's E because our power application just was preventing us from getting them. Uh, when you have slower pyro, it will still s slow or reduce the amount of seeds you can get, but you will at least be able to get some. So that's generally why people use Toma a lot because Toma's burst has a three hit 2.5 second ICD, which means that generally it will only apply pyro every three waves, meaning that you won't trigger too much burning. Uh, so that helps a lot with that. Because Burgeon is a reaction that just like Bloom is a lot better in AOE than in single target, then generally Hydro applicators that apply in AOE also have some value in Burgeon teams. But yeah, at a baseline, I'd say that which is straight up Burgeon teams that only have Hydro, Dendro, and Pyro can very much find themselves struggling because of the interaction, unless you go with like two Hydro units to make sure that you really have a lot of Hydro. But outside of that, generally Burgeon teams are a little bit meh. But this abyss is so good for Burgeon that you'll still be able to get through content without much of a problem. However, there are ways of using the Burgeon reaction that will bypass this burning problem and just make everything feel a lot better. So it, instead of using a second Hydro unit, you can basically use any element that can react with Pyro. That way you can remove some of the burning on the enemy. Your Hydro will actually be enough to both vape and bloom, so you'll get a lot more seeds. Right, so just like earlier, we were getting a pretty garbage number of total seeds with Changling, Yelan, and Naida. If I add Kea in the team, who can apply Cryo and trigger Melt and reduce that burning aura, Right? We are generating quite a lot more seeds, right? Even when we don't use Elan's E. You can do that with a bunch of different elements. You can do it with Cryo, obviously. You can do it with Animo, and you can do it with Electro. Now, depending on which one of these elements you use it with, uh, you can actually get a bunch of different interactions from all of the reactions that you have, right? So when you use Cryo, that gives you access to, to the fridge mechanic, which I'm sure we can put a, like the, the little eye thing here for a video on fridge. But fridge is basically, when you put Cryo on the enemy, because you're triggering Freeze and Bloom, you're removing less Dendro when you apply Hydro, which means that you effectively trigger more seeds. So when you put a Cryo unit in Virgin, you can take advantage of that mechanic to get even more seeds than just when you melt and weaken the burning aura. When you use Electro, you're getting a bunch of overloads now, right? And your Pyro unit is built for EM, right? They're built for Burgeon damage, which means that those overloads will actually do a pretty reasonable amount of damage. And you're also gonna get a little bit of Electro Charge. And finally, when you're doing an Animal unit, well, you can use the an Animal unit that will be able to trigger the seeds themselves because Animal units can get Pyro Infusions or Pyro Absorptions in their abilities, right? You look at Kazuha's E, you look at Kazuha's Burst, Sugoso's Burst, stuff like that. All of those things, because they have a lot of different mechanics, mechanics that you can use. I generally call them different names. Now the names I use are oven, curry, and saute. Oven because it's like fridge, it's like the fridge mechanic, but with pyro, so it's hot. It's like a hot fridge. Curry because you're using four elements that trigger a bunch of like reactions, including electro charge and overload, which is pretty similar to soup. But instead of mixing them all up with your animo, you're putting some some vegetables with the with the dendro, so it's kind of like curry. And um, saute because generally it's a team that only really works with Kazuha as the animal option, and he jumps, and Sote is jumped. 
in French. And uh, we're getting all the, the culinary terms, so it's like in the same in the same theme. Anyways, point being, Burgeon themes in general, not that great, but the Burgeon archetypes that take advantage of those mechanics are actually pretty solid. And this bit specifically, I've been really enjoying basically all of them. I'd say that Sauté is generally a little bit more situational than the other ones. And this abyss, it feels really bad on the first side, but it's pretty solid on the second side. Generally though, I'd go towards curry and oven, which is like with Electro and with Cryo, a bit more than with Animo. So the main advantage of the one with Electro is you get a lot of overload, you get a little more single target damage because less of your damage is tied to Burgeon. And Burgeon obviously in AoE, you're getting more seeds, so you're triggering more Burgeon. Whereas Oven has the main advantage that, well, you have Freeze, which means the enemy, the enemies actually do stay frozen for a pretty reasonable portion of the fight. Like right now, I don't think I have enough ER in my Toma because I haven't built him recently. But if I just show like the, the, the baseline interaction in a rotation, you'll see that they actually stay frozen for a pretty reasonable amount of time. Right, so they spend like about half the time frozen, uh, which can be even higher if you use a unit that has better cryo application, like potentially someone like Ganyu. Um, but them spending a bunch of time frozen obviously means that if there are more aggressive enemies, like you actually have in Chamber 2 with the Consecrated Beast, uh, they're a little bit easier to deal with. Uh, same thing for this chamber right here. All in all, I'd say that Oven feels pretty, pretty decent on side 2. Not too great on side 1, but functional until you get to this in this abyss. And Curry actually feels very good on both sides. Burgeon in general, like I said, pretty rough in single target. You can still just use single target focused units. So like Singto Ilan, Nahida, Toma, and it's still a Burgeon team. But like the Burgeon is not what's making the team good, right? It's the, in single target at least, it's the single target damage from your single target units. Oven against bosses, so like the Kenkis, doesn't feel all that great. It's still fine because even if you don't freeze, you still use the cryo to weaken the burning and get more seeds. But the main upside that it has is removed from you so it's not as valuable anymore. Sauté is very good when you need grouping because grouping plus burgeon against a lot of enemies very good but when enemies are not groupable it generally feels pretty horrendous. Curry against non-heavy enemies that get knocked back easily. I mean sometimes you look at Geovit shops, you look at treasure hoarders, stuff like that can be a Bulls. pain in the ass for Curry. I just realized though I haven't talked about just normal bloom without Nilo. Normal bloom without Nilo is kind of like the same thing as bloom with Nilo, but just a lot worse. Bloom kind of sucks because the seeds take so long to explode. You need the enemies to stay grouped like very, a very, very long time and not move that much. And you need to have a lot of enemies for it to actually be good. It's functional this abyss because enemies group themselves up and all that. But honestly, in this chamber, right, the Scorching Lore Master is gonna burgeon a lot of your bloom, so it won't, like, a lot of your damage is just gonna Bulls. disappear. This kind of abyss is probably the best it'll ever be, <laughs> but generally, don't try to force it. And then, uh, uh, other than that, you also have Fridge that I mentioned earlier, the mechanic. You can use that in a normal bloom team, and uh, same thing, meh. The upside that Fridge has is you're keeping enemies frozen a pretty large portion of the time, even more than nothing because you don't have that pyro to melt them, which means it's easier to keep them all in one spot and to prevent them from attacking you, your seeds with pyro or electro. So it's not as bad in an abyss like this one, but it's still pretty shit compared to uh, a lot of the Burgeon teams. Uh, I've already mentioned Overvape a little bit when I was talking about National, so I don't think I have anything else to say for Overvape, but Overvape is a good segue into Soup. So Soup is like the, the OG culinary team where you use an Animo, a Pyro, an Electro, and a Hydro unit all together so that your Pyro unit or your pyro application triggers overloads on top of vaping, and then you have an animal unit to reduce resistance to all three of the other elements. You get a bunch of electric charge. A lot of damage just happens. Soup teams, the like the most well-known one is the, the Sukokomon team. It would be Kokomi, Fischl, Sucrose, Tangling. But there are other like very, very strong soup teams. So you can go for something like on-field Raiden with an off-field Hydro, and then Bennett 
Kazuha or Bennett Jean. Or you can do the other way around, an on-field Hydro with someone like Fischl. I'd say that in this Abyss, soup teams actually feel very good. Generally, soup teams have a decent amount of overload, but also some amount of grouping, so to, to like balance it out. But they also have very solid single target output, especially especially the versions that use units you know, like Singto and Fischl. Personally, I really, really like using Sucrose, Fischl, Chainlane, and Singto. It doesn't really have bad matchups, so obviously this Abyss, very good. And it's a, it's a team that uses Electro, so it's good against Simon as well. Uh, another one of the, the, the culinary teams is Salad, which is kind of like soup, but instead of Pyro, you have some vegetables, you have your Dendro. Uh, salad also feels very strong this Abyss, because on top of well, just being an incredibly strong baseline team, something like this, right? It has Electro to deal with this pretty easily, but also it takes advantage of Quicken, right? Because you'll trigger some Quicken, which means that you reduce Electro and Dendro resistance pretty often. Salad teams basically rely on applying Electro to the enemy, and trying not to hit the seeds with your Electro so that your Animal can swirl that Electro onto the seeds and your Animal unit is the one that triggers the Hyper Bloom. But yeah, obviously it's a team that doesn't have a healer or a shielder. You do have the damage resistance that Singto provides, so can be a bit difficult for people who struggle without healing. Talon is always good, but it does struggle to slot in defensive units. And so when Chambers are very aggressive, it's something that not everyone will be able to play. Now the last one of the culinary teams, which I've dubbed Air Frost, Fryer. Basically, a burning team with animal units to trigger Pyro Swirl, and by triggering Pyro Swirl, applying Pyro, and gaining ownership of the burning, which means that those animal units that are built fully M are the ones who decide the burning damage, which means that your burning does a bit more generally. Their DPS is shit, but with a unit like Nahida, you can maintain burning on all the enemies with basically no effort, which means that if the enemies are somewhat squishy, but like there's a lot of them and they're hard to group, or they're generally a little bit far from each other, Air Fryer actually becomes very, very strong, just because it's low DPS is enough because the, 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 the obstacle to clearing is not getting good DPS, it's consolidating your DPS and making sure that your damage is hitting all the enemies. And because it's so easy to do that with our Fryer teams, then they'll generally be pretty strong in an abyss like this one on the second side. Do not play them on the first side, you won't clear in time. Have I talked about Melgan you? No, I haven't. Melgan is fine, but when you look at like actual DPS, considering your ER requirements and the fact that you most of the time have to battery your, your source of all field pyro, the actual DPS over time time isn't that good, uh, but it does have pretty good front-loaded damage before you need to battery, right? Which means that when you're doing speed running, when you're whaling, it's a team that actually skills pretty well with that. But honestly, at like free to play level investment, it's just not a team I would recommend. Next up, Reverse Melt Quick Swap. So thing about Ganyu Melt, remove the way that it scales really well with vertical investment whaling and replace it with just a higher performance at low investment and being a lot easier to use and you get a re Reverse Melt Quick Swap team. So the, the baseline one is... Uh, is this, but you can kind of replace any of the units except Bennett. All right, you can replace Sangling for Kazuha because Kazuha can apply off field pyro and then Bennett can also apply pyro here and there. You can replace Kayo or Rosaria with either Ganyu herself, but use like as a burst bot, or you can replace it with Chongyun, you can replace it with. There's a lot of options, but like the base core is this. You do need to like build all of your units for their damage, but you're not reliant on making sure that you reach specific DPS thresholds for it not to feel like garbage like Mount Ganyu is because if you don't want to rotate the enemies it just feels like trash. Good damage per screenshot but not great DPS. This has pretty good DPS and doesn't have as much damage per screenshot. This Abyss a little bit rough against the Consecrated Beast because they're very very aggressive and because you're self-applying Pyro, specifically the Scorpion, you need to make sure you dodge it because you're gonna get fooled otherwise. And also Rosaria's E. Rosaria's E is very easy to cancel. Like the enemies can cancel Rosaria's E with like by bolts breathing on you. They do and you get cancelled out of it, and it goes on cooldown, and it doesn't generate energy if that happens, and because these enemies are very, very aggressive, it can happen a lot more often than it usually does. Usually it's a thing that, like, it's very, very annoying when it happens, but it ha it'll happen, like, once every 20 Abyss runs. Now it happens, like, twice per time you get through the Consecrated Beast. It's a pain, but these are, like, just issues that are nice to mention, but they're not, like, major issues. You can still work around it. Make sure you don't use your E at the wrong moment, and you'll be fine. Revmel Quicksaw teams are pretty strong, 
in general. Uh, their main downside is that they don't have grouping and they're kind of circle impacty, which means that against enemies that don't group themselves up for you, they won't always feel the greatest. Uh, but this abyss has enemies that group themselves up for you, so it'll feel pretty good. And then finally, we get to the last and arguably most important part of the teams, which is the Hyper Bloom stuff. I kept Hyper Bloom for last because honestly, otherwise, everything else I would have said, I probably would have said, but you could just play Hyper Bloom instead and that's better. <laughs> <laughs> Hyper Bloom is very good. This abyss specifically, Hyper Bloom has Electro and Dendro, which means that it can deal with Simon very, very well. It triggers Quicken, which means that you get the Blessing very, very consistently. And it has good single target, so it's very good here. But also if you use applicators that have good AoE, it also has good AoE, which means that it's also good on the second side. Hyper Bloom in general is just always good, but Hyper Bloom this abyss is even better. Okay, right, because this is supposed to be a meta roundup, Right now, the meta is Hyper Bloom. Obviously, Hyper Bloom is not something that scales all that well with vertical investment. You're not gonna have that like, okay, I'm getting my five star weapon, I'm getting a C6 five star, I'm one-shotting this shit. But it has such a high baseline that you compare it to C2 five stars, and it's still generally better with a lot of the good five stars. Hyper Bloom is just very, very strong in a baseline, and the level of artifact investment that you need for non-Hyper Bloom teams to outshine the Hyper Bloom teams is actually generally very, very high. Uh, just baseline Hyper Bloom, you have an Electro unit, you have a Dendro unit, you have some Hydro. Your Dendro unit, generally the better one is Nahida. Your Hydro unit, if you're in single target, generally Singto is going to be your best choice. If you're in AoE, you'd want something like Ayato. And then your Electro unit, there's generally two that are very good, and those are Raiden or Kuki. If we're looking at the Salad teams, you'd rather have an Electro unit that doesn't trigger the seed, so someone like Fischl, who, who only triggers them sometimes, or someone like Beto, whose burst bounces don't trigger seeds, will be very good in those Salad teams. In Baseline Hyper Bloom teams, you'd rather use something like Raiden or Kuki. Uh, you can also use an on-field Electro, but generally, in order for those Hyper Blooms to do a good amount of damage, you're gonna have to build a lot of EM, which means you're building less damage percent and you're building less crit, which means that on-fielding your Electro unit generally won't do as much as it otherwise could. So generally, Kuki or Raiden are the better options, but you still can on-field Electro units. And then your last last option can either be a second Electro unit that doesn't hit the Cs, like Beto or Fischl that doesn't hit them that often, or a second Dendro unit if you already have really, really fast Hydro, but you don't have fast Dendro, so if you don't have Nahida, you have something like Yao Yao, then you can go for a second Dendro unit. And then you can also just go for a second Hydro unit if you already have fast Dendro, mainly because the Hydro units generally have higher damage than the Dendro units, like without reactions, and also because, well, it can get you more seeds. The team that I would say, I don't want to say most meta, because Obviously, if you're willing on a character, it can shift the scales. This is not a team that scales the best with vertical investment. It's not that insane in AoE, even if it's still pretty good just because it has so much damage. All in all, like this is pretty much a very, very solid team. Teams like this, like Hyperloom teams in general, are kind of what's shaping the meta right now. I'd say that they're the reasons why Abyss DPS requirements are going up because that low investment damage output that you can reach is higher now. With Hyper Bloom, you also have some other mechanics that you can work with. So you've got the Quick Bloom mechanic, which is basically if your Hydro is not that fast, you're getting less Cs, but in exchange, uh, you can have your Quick and Uptime stay higher. And with higher quicken uptime, you get more spreads and you get more aggravates. So you can do something like using a slower Hydro, so instead of saying, so you use someone like Yelan uh, with double Dendro. I don't have Alhytham, but like Alhytham would be a good example here. Uh, or another different slower Hydro, like you can use an off-field Ayato burst, or you can use Kokomi, something like that. You can use Barbara. You can also use two Electro units, right, with like Beto or something. Quick Bloom isn't necessarily better or worse than Hyper Bloom. It effectively just means that you have to build your units slightly differently because in like baseline Hyper Bloom, you're not getting a lot of spreads and a lot of aggravates, which changes the kind of builds that you want to have on your Electro and Dendro unit versus in Quick Bloom teams where you have a lot more aggravates and spread. But both can be good at the end of the day. If you're losing quick enough time, it's because you're gaining more seeds. And if you're, if you're losing seeds, it's because you're gaining quick enough time. Depending on your level of investment, either can be slightly better, but either way, both are good. And then finally, remember the fridge mechanic? Well, you can use that shit in Hyper Bloom as well. Personally, that's kind of my favorite thing right now. I love Hyper Fridge, right? So you just add a cryo unit to your, to your team and you get the same thing, except Electro doesn't mess with freeze quite as much as Pyro does, which means that you get even better freeze up time. That's not the button I wanted to press, but whatever. Right, you can see the enemies stay frozen for a pretty, for a very good 
portion of the fight. But then on double die, you're also gaining the like additional seeds that you can get from uh, from the fridge mechanic. Personally, I Bulls. love it. It's something you can do with any cryo unit, almost. I'd say the ones that work best are generally Kea, Ayaka, and Ganyu. With Ganyu, generally, it's not like on-field Ganyu, it's just a bunch of ER off-field Ganyu. Diona works, but her cryo op is really slow, but in exchange, you get that 200 EM if you have C6, so it's still fine, and it's a defensive option. Chongyun can work, but it's not that good. Generally, I just really like Hyper Fridge. I think it's really fun. And it's a version of Hyper Bloom with good freeze up time, but it's also a freeze team that's still really good against bosses. In my eyes, it's kind of the best of both worlds. And even though it's generally not the team I'll play if I'm trying to speedrun something, when it comes to comfort, it's probably my favorite team right now. It's 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 uh, a dark horse, let's say. It's a team that's not very popular, but that honestly should be. Uh, if you have a Hyperloom team built up, I would highly encourage trying to swap one of your units for a Cryo unit and playing Hyper Fridge. Uh, now, obviously, if you're playing Ayaka Hyper Fridge, you're gonna need a lot of ER, which means you probably wanna go Emblem instead of Blizzard Strayer, because you don't have a Cryo battery to help you out with your ER requirements anymore. Uh, oh yeah, also, you can also use Lila and other units like that. All in all, I like it a lot, and it's definitely something that I can recommend. But yeah, I think that basically does it for the meta roundup. I think that my plan from here is gonna be to do one of these every patch. Uh, obviously, I'm not gonna explain all the thing as much in each video, but like talk about what's changed with the new Abyss rotation uh, and with any new units. I'm probably gonna have some new things to say about Mono Pyro and On Field Vape for next patch, and maybe it's for Hyper Carry as well. Uh, they will not be nice things though, I can tell you that much. But I think I'll try to end each meta roundup video with my favorite teams for this Abyss. I really, really love Hyper Fridge this Abyss. I also really, really like Thundering Furry. It's hard to make both of them work out at the same time, so I'm probably gonna have to play a slightly inferior version of Hyper Fridge using a unit like Yulan. Well, that's okay. It's still very good. I missed my E. Aw, oh, they didn't group well. Mod. Ah, 
as you can see, right, the... The freeze is far from permanent. It's far from being a permafreeze, but it's so helpful when it comes to, like, just getting hit less often. Like, I don't even have to focus that much on dodging, and it's as if they weren't aren't, weren't attacking me. They did move outside of the E, which is annoying, though, but whatever. Oh, come on. I don't want to use my burst. do the right thing, but it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we managed to iframe the thing, but they're not grouped very well, which is annoying. Oh well. Still have a special place. They don't need to be grouped very well, let's be honest. This team is a broken ass shit. Okay, let's swap out and make sure we finish with our bursts. Bosses, like, yeah, you don't get the freeze, but you definitely do still get some value out of the fridge, even without freeze. And you're still getting very, very reasonable clear times. I just hope I don't die of cringe here. I think I might die of cringe. It's gonna survive, isn't it? Oh, whatever. Still, though, very reasonable. Alright, let me do this. And you just start killing everything. And now this one's dead, and the pets for the other two are dead as well. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to use a second rotation, I think, because, uh... Oh, they were not in the circle, so... It's fine, though, because, yeah. So, these are my two favorite teams for this abyss. Both of which are actually very, very malleable in terms of which units you can use, which means that you can try versions of this team without any five stars. Maybe not two at once, right? Like maybe not both on each side of the abyss because like they both kind of want same toe. But in general, just any sort of hyper fringe. And then like, this is my favorite curry team, which is Thundering Furry, which is uh, relies on Bennett C6. So if you don't have Bennett C6, generally better to stick to someone like Toma. But but yeah, so that does it for the meta roundup. I hope you learned a thing or two. I hope, uh, I hope it was entertaining. Uh, this probably gonna end up being a pretty long video the future ones should be a little bit shorter but yeah give those give those two teams a try and give any other teams that you thought seemed interesting from from this a try so thank you for watching don't forget to go follow on twitch subscribe on youtube and on twitch true i'll see you guys now bye youtube